Well, thank you so much for having us. We're so excited to be here today. Um, this is a really a project that has come a really long way. And so we're very happy uh, with the stage at which it is at. And um, as uh, Dave Harding, our faculty director for DLab, mentioned that the this specific talk is going to be really focused on the constructing interval variables via faceted rash measurement and multitask deep learning, and really focusing on the debiasing, explainability, and the interval measurement of hate speech. And um, I wanted to just start out by thanking some folks. First of all, I'm very appreciative to Chris Kennedy, the lead author of the current manuscript. And, and if it's not in the chat, I know that it was circulated, but in case anybody doesn't have the preprint, perhaps we could pop it in the, in the chat. Thank you. Um, he is um, currently, as Dave was saying, a postdoc at the Harvard Medical School, but he's just been a huge uh, DLab contributor. And he's also a BIDS uh, fellow, of course, and so he's just been a really wonderful partner and colleague. And um, the other thing I want to emphasize is that we've really benefited from an incredibly rich interdisciplinary group. And it's one that's been, I would say, multi-generational, uh, people at different stages of their uh, scholarship and their academic career. And in, in that vein, we're so excited that Aniket Kasari, now a postdoc at DLab, and also uh, working with the computational social science course, um, and T32 uh, with David Mongeau and, and, and the BIDS folks uh, that has joined the team and also Renata Barreto, uh, who is a doctoral uh, student in law has also our newest member. So we're just really so happy that we are constantly expanding and um, the, the team is growing in different ways and maturing in different ways. We also want to give a special uh, thank you to Mark Wilson for guiding our work um, and for being a consultant and an advisor for us um, there at the Berkeley Evaluation and Assessment Research Center. And really, this work is not uh, you know, possible to do without funding. And BIDS um, has been incredibly generous and kind with us, not only funding this research specifically, but multiple fellows along the way. Um, and so that's been a huge support, along with some funding from the Anti-Defamation League and Google Jigsaw. Um, the, this project is uh, primarily based out of uh, UC Berkeley's D-Lab, but now with um, Chris heading over to Harvard, we now have at least a two uh, university um, collaboration, but uh, along with Dave Harding, um, we are also working on social media research on a sort of broader scale and, and one direction that this work is taking that is we're actually combining pretty large data sets, making those data sets available for different scholars at UC Berkeley and potentially beyond, and really thinking hard about how to advance research uh, that's based out of social media and that is computational in nature, so data science and social media research. So we're really excited that this work is going in, in many different directions. And one of them is really, um, it's really important for us to think about what are the other higher education institutions that we're partnering with? What are other platforms such, such as Jigsaw um, that we're partnering with? And also um, what are activist and nonprofit organizations uh, such as historically with the Anti-Defamation League and currently with the Southern Poverty Law Center? That exchange and dialogue is really key to us. Um, uh, three years ago, I started to have conversations with a colleague who worked at the Anti-Defamation League um, by the name of Britton Heller. And we were really concerned because a lot of Jewish uh, journalists were being targeted on Twitter. And um, we were also really uh, concerned because there was, a, uh, we were perceiving a rise of xenophobia and really derogatory comments against specific racial and ethnic groups online. And so we really wanted to do something because we felt that there was a connection between that xenophobia 
and misinformation and lack of education of the sort of American populace. And so what we did three years ago was convene a group of scholars um, and activists for a day long seminar to think together about how we might um, operationalize this research, uh, what a research agenda might look like. And so it's really uh, rewarding and I'm so happy to see where the work has gone and, and the partnerships that we've been able uh, to forge along the way. The topics that we'll cover today uh, will be the motivation behind the project, a very quick overview just to give you a sense of the, the operationalization of, of the research, the theorization and sort of a deeper dive into the theorization. And then we're gonna talk about the, the IRT and deep learning. So um, we have a, a, a lot to cover, but we're excited and, and, and uh, we wanna hear from you. Please, we do encourage you to ask questions, put your questions in the chat, and we hope to leave plenty of time to engage with you. So I would say that the number one concern that we had that motivated this research, um, although a lot of other things have come from it, was that as we discussed um, what was happening, we saw that there was uh, mounting evidence that connected hate speech to hate crimes. And so we were very concerned not only about um, kind of reaching a tipping point where we um, saw individuals, anti-racist activists being um, heard and even killed, uh, but that this was also escalating to the point of groups of people, potentially um, genocidal acts, uh, what would be classified as genocidal acts. And so um, we were really alarmed and, and concerned about that. Many of the members of the team have a background in politics or political science um, and, um, and um, joined today uh, with us as well is um, Alexander Son. Uh, he's a political scientist and has been a huge part of, of the team, um, both with the theorization um, and also uh, the development of the survey instrument. And so having that background, I think, really um, caused us to think hard about uh, what was happening here and what were the dangers to our democracy. Um, subsequently, uh, this is a bit of an aside, that we applied for a social science research council grant and that, that grant that I was alluding to earlier and, and Alexander is part of that as well as is Aniket and, and Renata. Um, in part of that, we, we, we're trying to think about how is this impacting the you know, democratic process, the changing landscape of media, and we're doing this in partnership with the uh, social science matrix. And so you'll hear more about that. And we look forward to inviting you into those conversations. So in a, on a sort of more technical level to think about all the different moving parts as I talk more deeply about this, um, I want to give you a sense of the flow of how this has worked. Um, we've taken in API data collection from YouTube, Twitter, and Reddit. And this is a significantly, um, um, a significant corpus of social media data. I would say, um, as Chris and I have had conversations with many different folks doing this kind of research, uh, we believe that is what it's going to be one of the largest um, uh, data sets of social media comments available for analysis. And the fact that it's cross platform, uh, we feel is very important. And so we're, we're excited to make that data set available. And um, Aaron Coolidge, uh, Deputy DLab Director is supporting and making that data uh, available uh, for scholars. And so we have a very complex system for um, uh, batching the comments and then having those comments labeled by a mechanical, a set of mechanical Turk workers. Uh, we collect really 
specific democrat uh, demographic information about the mechanical turk workers and so we know um who they are in terms of at least self-reported their gender and ethnicity race um, age demographics backgrounds etc and so those uh, mechanical turk workers label uh, the corpus and that labeling is done through a servant instrument which i will be discussing in, in some detail and ultimately we have uh, not only the larger corpus of comments, uh, but actually a really well curated um, data set that has a representation of hate speech from um, sort of the least hateful speech or even positive identity speech all the way to violent and genocidal hate speech. And we'll be uh, talking about that more. And um, the training data set is what is used for uh, developing the model, the deep learning model. And so um, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to talk about that as well. But I kind of wanted to give you a sense of the totality of, of the cycle. And in fact, we've gone through these cycles a few times at this point, but um, as you can imagine, it, it's, it's, it's important to do so with machine learning. So um, I'm gonna shift now to talk about theory development. And uh, this very busy slide is one that gives you a little bit of a sense of the kinds of um, literature that we delved into. And so first and foremost, again, we spoke um, about the constructing measures um, approach that Mark Wilson uh, proposes in his book. He also has two different courses. Um, uh, one that's more conceptual, one that's really based on the statistics of item response theory. A couple of us on the team have gone through those courses and have met with uh, Mark and Karen, and they've been wonderful. In that book and in, the, in that method, what they propose is that the first thing that you need to do with any complex uh, phenomena, uh, social scientific phenomena is to really have a, a, a very clear understanding among the research team what it is that you are grappling with. And in order to do that, we um, started to interrogate the, the hate speech uh, literature. And what we found was that the literature was somewhat nascent still in our, in our opinion, that it was a little bit disparate it didn't really kind of build off of one study off of another in a way that was as systematic as we would have hoped. And um, so, for example, one study might have taken place in Germany, another study uh, might have been in a couple different countries. And so it was very difficult to kind of um, um, build from that foundation. And so we decided, decided to bound our work to the American context, to the United States um, of America, and to English as the language that we would be analyzing. Uh, not a multilingual corpus at this time, although that is one of the things that we want to move towards in the future. And so there's a few things that um, I want to um, uh, say in the process of uh, thinking about these issues, we felt that we really wanted to build a robust um, definition for ourselves of what um, hate speech is. And we found that there's not a stable um, definition of hate speech in the literature. There's different definitions in, um, in, in academic uh, papers and uh, sort of legal and regulatory contexts, and even in sort of common vernacular and, and the way that uh, people normally use the term hate speech. In fact, in a lot of these works here, um, the term is uh, put in um, quotes because of, there's not really a stable definition of hate speech. And so it's important to kind of um, to, to acknowledge that. And so um, we combined all those different, the academic, legal and uh, regulatory. And when we say regulatory, we're referring to all of the different 
platforms have regulations for monitoring and deciding whether they want to flag hate speech um, or different types of speech on their uh, platforms. And so those are um, regulations that we also reviewed. And so going back to um, this previous um, diagram where the different mechanical Turk workers are labeling the comments um, we consider the fact that it's uh, really every individual that comes to read a specific comment is going to be informed by their own lived experience, um, by, by their own um, use of language, uh, the discourse community, the linguistic community that they belong to. And so it's going to be very difficult to, um, you know, each person is going to bring a different perspective. And so our method enables us to take that into um, uh, consideration. And um, so again, uh, I just want to say that um, uh, for this reason, we started to dig deeper into um, the notions of what might be um, a, a common definition for us. So the first thing that we do is we think about the different components of hate speech. And um, for us, it was very important that we ground our work on a target population. So this inc includes uh, different racial, ethnic, uh, differently abled groups, gender, um, et, cetera, et cetera, what would be called in sort of more legal terms, protected groups. Um, and uh, to me, it's really important to keep in mind that this includes groups of people that have been historically and systematically discriminated against. Um, this is the work, you know, as well of the Anti-Defamation League of, of, you know, protecting certain groups that have been uh, discriminated against. And so that is a huge factor in our survey instrument and is uh, one of the things that we first ask in, um, in the survey instrument that a mechanical Turk worker is presented with. And um, the other thing I wanted to add about that is that our survey instrument is able to and, and allows for a lot of nuance uh, regarding the target uh, of the hateful speech and the comment that is being presented in the labeling process. So I think it's really important to think about the intersectional um, issues here, that it's not simply a race or ethnicity issue or a gender issue, but rather when, you know, someone is both Black and female, that you know, presents a whole, you know, different potentially uh, set of concerns. And so um, we really hit upon uh, these different um, racial, ethnic, religious, um, national origin, citizenship status, uh, gender, sexual orientation, age, disability. Um, and, and we really uh, include a very complex uh, set of identities here. And um, that in the literature is something that there is a, a sort of widespread understanding that there are certain groups of people that are being uh, targeted. Uh, another area that there's uh, widespread uh, agreement on is that there's usually going to be um, a strong sentiment, uh, usually negative, strongly negative sentiment in, in hate speech. And so, of course, that's another piece that we um, request to have uh, labeled in the comment. And um, we, we think about issues that have to do with 
uh, respect. And we also think about issues that have to do with insults. I wanna take a moment to, to discuss slurs and insults in our work. Um, it's, language is a highly contextual um, issue and it can be quite challenging to see if a bad word, a slur is used in a way that is derogatory. So for example, if the B word is being used uh, in the LGBT community, LGBTQ community, for example, it could be used as a term of endearment. Um, it could signal that there's um, a, a intimacy between the people uh, in the in-group that are discussing something. So um, uh, Judith Butler talks about this and um, sociolinguists talk about this extensively. And so this is a huge challenge for the work that we're conducting because a lot of what is being um, interpreted is decontextualized. And so that's something that um, I want to emphasize that the deciphering by the speaker and who the speaker is, is very important. Who the target population in relationship to the, the speaker is very important. And this um, context can become obscured uh, in, in social media research. And so that's something that we're exploring um, with uh, Marianne Forsad, uh, Forcad, um from the Social Science Matrix and, and that project that I was mentioning earlier uh, is, is sort of these contextual uh, issues, like how can you sort of incorporate temporal um, dimensions to, um, to this? Uh, we have these various components of hate speech that we're concerned about. And again, there's a lot of theorization that goes into uh, these specific components. Uh, so in particular, uh, thinking through uh, how to kind of like break down what how, how, what hate speech is. This is like a really important lesson for uh, thinking how to do this in other contexts as well, because we're not just presenting uh, one particular method just for hate speech. Uh, but rather how to break it down, how to operationalize uh, such a kind of co uh, difficult concept. Uh, basically with anything kind of complex like hate speech where there are a variety of different definitions and people can conceptualize it differently, what I think might be different from what Claudia thinks might be different from what Chris thinks about the same comment and about this kind of idea as a whole. Uh, operationalizing it through this definition, this is important from both a theoretical perspective so that we can understand what it is exactly that we're going after, uh, as well as from a methodological perspective. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes as well. So we settled on these variety of, on these uh, components, uh, which comes from mostly the ADL's uh, pyramid of hate. So conceptualizing the various way, the various dimensions of hate speech. So for example, the overall kind of sentiment, uh, what is the uh, respect? And we give a little prompt saying, is this comment respectful? Then we have things like dehumanization. Does it uh, dehumanize the group that is being talked about here? Uh, and then we have all the way up through up to uh, genocide. Does it call for uh, genocidal acts against that particular group? And then we have this little component here, attack, defend. Uh, is the comment attacking or defending the group that you previously identified? Uh, so this bit is important because uh, I think as Claudia was saying, there's a lot of context that goes on here, right? So oftentimes you might get a comment that is using words that are associated with uh, hateful comments, but uh, actually has quite a different meaning to it. Uh, so I like to think of like sarcasm, for example, as something that would be difficult to detect if you were just going based on whether or not certain words appear. Uh, there might also be a case where someone mentions a slur uh, but uses it as like, or mentions it in the in the context of counter speech. They say you shouldn't be using that word. They try to explain why that word uh, is problematic or why uh, why it's harmful to that particular group, right? So this attack defend dimension is a really important thing to go after because uh, it could be that the slur appears. It could be that there is language in there that's oftentimes associated with uh, hate speech, but. Uh, we need to kind of understand this context. 
And again, it's super, super important because just kind of throwing this into a more basic machine learning algorithm wouldn't necessarily uh, get you that kind of result. So thank you so much, um, Aniket. That's exactly right. So I think that um, um, for me, it's really important that we understand that different linguistic communities um, have different ways of communicating. And um, in fact, some, uh, some discourse communities use a lot of uh, bad words and uh, reclaim those terms in order to empower their community. And so we don't want to um, have an over um, reliance. So for this reason, we highly um, uh, strongly advise against having an over-reliance on slurs. Um, and we see that there's a lot of literature on hate speech that really focuses on, on slurs. Um, another reason why slurs are highly problematic, but um, we actually do want to capture this, this issue, but um, uh, the, the reason why the contextual aspect is really important as well is because there's always new slurs. Um, and we know that the, the white supremacy uh, movements actually are incredibly clever at coming up with new ways that are not gonna be detected by the platforms of saying horribly hateful uh, um, things. So for example, uh, a very uh, somewhat recent example is the term jogger uh, to refer to Black Americans in reference um, to the murder of Ahmed Arbery, uh, who was jogging when he was shot by two white, shot to death by two white men. Uh, but there's a lot of other similar, and um, I apologize if uh, any of what I say is upsetting. Um, there's a lot of uh, other similar terms uh, that are highly racialized um, uh, that have been in the literature that we have found in the literature, such as uh, s Skittles for Muslims and um, beaners for Mexicans and bagels for Jews. These, these terms are um, sort of coded language. Some of them are very common and, 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 and known, uh, but some of them are very obscure. And so that presents uh, a really sort of a, another layer of, of challenge, but we do feel that um, certainly these, these insults, this lack of respect all sort of culminates in and is part of what happens in the process of what the Anti-Defamation um, League would call the pyramid of hate and what uh, Susan Benesh and the Dan Dangerous um, Speech uh, group has created a framework for thinking about this, this type of speech uh, that leads to uh, genocidal, so violent acts and genocidal acts. Um, and so part of that is dehumanization and the use of these terms that make a person not uh, be as, um, you know, uh, seen as a human being, but seen as, uh, as an animal, as a cockroach. And um, so in terms of the scope, we really uh, want to um, look at the, the levels here. So our theorized levels of hate these are the qualitative ordered uh, levels of hate speech uh, that I'm describing. They are not um, the, the actual scores that I will talk about in one second. Um, but these theorized levels of hate uh, uh, in, our, in our thinking originally started with counter speech. Later, empirically, we realized that it started really more with positive identity speech and then went to counter speech, then to neutral and bias, hostility, dehumanization, violent and genocidal. And a word about counter speech, uh, one of the things that we I find uh, really important to think about is that counter speech in the literature may be informing, may be defending, may be protecting, it may use humor to kind of bring down the tone of aggression. And so it's a, it's a very interesting way that uh, counter speech operates. And so part of what I heard Annika talk about is that in-group and out-group and the protect and defend uh, components. And if you go to the next slide, Annika. Now, um, uh, 
this, and I apologize, this could be triggering for folks. This is then how later the, it translates into a hate score. So through the instrument and through the labeling process, we actually then are able to take a comment or a corpus and give it a specific hate score. And we'll go into more specifically how that operates. And if you don't mind, um, Annika, to go to slide number nine. Um, so what I do want to say before I turn it over to Aniket is that um, the work that we've done is able to achieve many things as compared to other related work. This theorization and this grappling qualitatively and through sort of interpretive means has enabled us to construct um, uh, and to think about the multiple identity categories, 50 different identity categories as compared to um, other similar work. It's enabled us to think about all the different construct levels, um, the nuances and, and the different ways that, that the comments are, are, are manifesting. The outcome space has a much greater uh, level of granularity as well. And um, I, I didn't have an opportunity to really talk about the, the, um, the, the rash, uh, the faceted rash IRT, and Anakit will get into more detail, but in the, what we are able to do is move away from uh, classical test theory, which is actually quite antiquated, and we're able to think about the labelers as, as we were discussing earlier. And uh, not only do we think about who the labeler is and the level of leniency and the level of, um, of um, uh, how lenient or strictly they're interpreting um, the, the re their reading of the comments um, and give them a specific score or a, a, a measure value, but also we're able to think about the comments themselves and we have a uh, networked way that each comment is uh, labeled multiple times, I think three times per comment. So we have a, a, a way that we're really much more advanced than interrater uh, reliability. Of course, it's kind of unfair to also talk about the algorithms and to some degree, because as time progresses, the, the different um, uh, models have evolved, but that is another way that uh, our work is stronger. And then the number of, of observations, we were able to label uh, 50,000 comments. Um, and so um, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Aniket so that he can go a little bit deeper now into the IRT and how that connects to the deep learning. Thank you. So I will skip down here a bit. Okay, so I'll start down here. I'll say a little bit about uh, how we actually did the labeling because I think it'll be of interest to uh, this crowd in particular. So as Claudia mentioned, we go beyond just using inter-rater reliability as a way uh, to label these kinds of comments. So for a lot of you coming from a, a traditional social science background, uh, one of the main issues we have anytime we're doing any kind of labeling of like, is a newspaper article liberal or conservative, for example, uh, one of the main issues is that the way I rate it might be different from the way uh, that the next person rates it. So that's a problem called inter-rater reliability that two different people uh, will rate the same thing uh, differently. We uh, use a method that essentially uh, takes, accepts the fact that that's going to be a uh, problem, that's going to be something that occurs. Let me, uh, that's going to be something that occurs. We accept, especially for a construct like hate speech, where the ground truth value is not like some objective thing, uh, that people are going to have different conceptions of what this complicated thing is. Uh, we accept that there is going to be inter-rater reliability. Uh, there won't be good inter-rater reliability. 
there's we're going to accept that and we're going to say and we're instead going to take advantage of that fact and uh, as claudia mentioned instead of chasing after that what we're more concerned about is intra rater reliability is the same person uh basically kind of making scores in a consistent way and if they can do that then we can actually correct for how lenient or severe uh, that person might be on a particular comment okay so if i look at a at a comment and i'm like uh that that looks like free speech i don't know i don't really think it's hate speech uh the next person looks at it and says oh that's horrible that's uh absolutely hate speech we want to be able to say we want to be able to correct for that right that i have this tendency not to score things too harshly um, the next person says no this is almost definitely uh, hate speech. We want to correct for that personal tendency uh, to uh, score things one way or another. So rather than do what we have on this slide here, where we have some comments and we assign the same three people uh, to each comment to check to see whether or not they have they get the same thing, we take this approach instead, where we get a comment and instead of batching people so that the same three people are looking at the same comment and then checking to see if those three people all say the same thing, we instead batch these comments. So each person is reviewing uh, three separate comments. And in doing so, and in uh, basically uh, shifting around which comments get assigned to which people, we get something that looks like this, where any given comment is gonna create a link between the various raters. So in this case, we have raters A and C are both looking at comment three. Raters C and E are both looking at comment five. So that kind of indirectly creates a link between raters A and E. And then each rater is given uh, three comments in this kind of model that we have here. What this essentially does, what the payoff of this is, is that for any given rater, we can estimate how severe they are, how lenient they are, uh, and make that correction. I'll talk about how we do that uh, in a second. Okay. So having flagged that, the next thing I want to talk about is the IRT scaling. So how do we go from these components of hate speech that we've now theorized and that we've uh, uh, operationalized in our survey instrument? Uh, we've now given the survey to uh, our MTurkers to label these comments. Uh, and again, we use this batch system. How do we then take the individual ratings? So the ratings on each of these components where each respondent says strongly disagree to strongly agree. How do we take that and then go ahead and translate that into uh, something that we can use to measure hate speech? So this is where uh, item response theory comes in. I'll zoom just slightly, there we go. This is where item response theory comes in. So what I'll say to kind of contextualize this, so all of you are probably familiar with uh, uh, questions on the SAT or the GRE or something like that. Uh, and the theory behind, and this is uh, in part what these methods were developed for. So when you take in a standardized exam like that, there are two things that are going on. First, they need the uh, examiners basically want to measure something like your uh, latent ability, like how good how smart are you or something like that? And we can get into the epistemological questions on that, uh, but that's the basic thing here that we're measuring some sort of ability on behalf of the test taker. And then the other thing that they, needs to be measured as well is how difficult is the item? How difficult is the question, right? So you would assume that a very uh, competent test taker, someone who, uh, scores well on that latent uh, smartness or whatever it is, should be able to uh, answer difficult questions fairly well. And they should also be able to answer fairly easy questions, right? The item difficulty is uh, doing the work of separating out uh, people based on, this, on their uh, kind of latent ability, right? So these two things together, both the item difficulty and that uh, latent ability that's being tested, that's what this theory uh, is doing in that context with the SAT or the GRE or something like that. In this case, we're using the method to basically say, okay, what is the uh, labeler's uh, inherent kind of severity, right? We use the fact that people are going to look at the same comment and think different things on our various hate speech components. 
Okay, we're going to use the fact that there are going to be uh, sort of different um, latent severities that they're going that they're going to bring to uh, any particular comet. We can then correct for their individual uh, kind of severity towards a comment by using item response theory, by estimating the difficulty of uh, the items that we're presenting them. So on each component, we're estimating uh, how difficult was this to kind of recognize that this was uh, probably genocidal or probably uh, humiliating or something like that. How difficult was it to recognize this fact? Uh, and then we can use these to kind of debias the uh, rater because we can basically correct for how severe or lenient uh, they might be. All right, so we have our eight components. We have basically ordinal responses from strongly disagree to strongly agree or something like it uh, on each of these components. And then what we could do is we can use IRT, we can use this estimation of the probability that someone get, gets a uh, item correct, essentially, use that estimation to go ahead and transform these eight ordinal components into a continuous hate score. All right, so we get something that looks like the hate speech score for this comment is a 2.5 plus or minus 0.3. And here are the components that led to uh, this estimation. So it's a continuous spectrum of uh, that measures how hateful uh, this comment is. Again, that's really important because it's basically uh, summarizing what these various uh, components are doing, and those components are drawn from uh, theorization of what uh, constitutes hate speech. All right, so just to kind of give you a sense, and this is a simplified version, but to give you a sense of what uh, it is that we're going, what that's going on, what we're essentially doing, what is the probability that you get a comment and you strongly agree with that comment being um, uh, being hu very humiliating. And what is the probability that me, Anakin, uh predicts that this thing is going to be strongly, uh, I'm going to strongly agree that this is humiliating. And basically use that prediction to say, OK, let me make a correction on uh, me, Anakin, uh, if I'm too severe or too lenient. I'm going to make a correction so that we can get something closer to uh, a uh, hate speech score that is kind of like an average of uh, what people would think. OK. And that's what gets us to something like this. That we essentially take our item difficulty. We use it to basically debias our comment scores and set them onto or project them onto this hate speech scale which ranges in this case from, I think, negative eight up to five. Negative eight being very, very supportive speech. Five being just kind of one, and we had that slide up there, uh, one, basically genocidal, as, ba as bad as the speech can actually get, right? So we use the eight kind of ordinal responses, transform them by IRT, make this correction based on the item difficulty, essentially, to then debias the scores and basically put them on this scale. So these uh, scores represent uh, the overall score for a particular comment, having been rated by two or three people and having those ratings then adjusted uh, via IRT. So we get, uh, like I said, from negative eight to eight, in this case, we go down to negative two, but we have certain levels And we get a hate score that is associated with those particular levels. And again, apologize on uh, a trigger warning for uh, some problematic and uh, potentially disturbing language uh, here. But hopefully this gets uh, gets you a sense of what it is that we're going after. Right, that some things might be neutral, some things uh, could be uh, hostile, but not quite uh, calling for violence or something like that. And what we're essentially doing is we're adding a lot of texture to this idea of what hate speech is by not just doing a one zero. Is it hate speech or not? Uh, we instead set it on this continuous spectrum. And that's what this right hand column is doing. Sets a continuous hate score so that we can meaningfully compare one comment to another and say, is it more hateful or not? Given these kinds of levels that we have uh, established in our theory. 
All right, so you can see what uh, this looks like in our data. We have our distribution across various social media platforms. We have our hate score on our X axis. We have our densities. And then we have them shaded by Reddit, Twitter, or YouTube. All right, so now let's get into the machine learning part. So we have our measure. We have, hopefully I've persuaded you that measuring hate speech uh, in a continuous way uh, is uh, more meaningful. Uh, so let's, like, let's think about how we would do this at scale. So we have several thousand comments labeled, but in practice, you might wanna do this on many more thousands or even millions of comments, given the volume that uh, occurs on these social media platforms. So how would we do that? A basic approach that you might uh, take to this question, it would be a standard machine learning uh, approach where you start with the raw comments. Uh, so you have the text of a comment on Reddit or something like that. Uh, you, trans you featureize it somehow. So at a very basic level, you could do a bag of words or TF-IDF to featureize that text. If you're doing something fancier, you will use word to vec or a transformer-based method like uh, Bert or Alberta, Roberta, any of these newer uh, kinds of things, represent the uh, text somehow, basically uh, convert it to numbers in some way. Train a machine learning model. So that could be a neural network as we show here, or it could even be uh, XGBoost, a random forest, a logistic regression, anything like that, to then produce a binary hate speech score. Zero or one, is this not hate speech or is it hate speech? Right, that would be a basic way to do it. Have people label, is this hate speech or not? And then go through this pipeline where we featureize the text and then we see if we can train a model that gets at that zero or one, makes that prediction correctly. We improve on this in a few different ways. So we start with the same concept. We start with the raw text. Uh, we featureize it in, a, in the same way, essentially using the state of the art BERT or something like that. Then when we do the training of a neural network, and again, there are extensions you could make, I think, with a random forest or something like that, and we, we could discuss that uh, in Q&A as well. When we train the neural network, we add as a feature the labeler bias. We treat this as a fixed effect. What is the labeler bias? Uh, so we incorporate that as a parameter uh, that's going to be uh, fed into the neural network. And then instead of predicting one binary hate speech score, is it zero or one? We predict each of our uh, components. So we predict uh, in an ordinal fashion, uh, strongly disagree to strongly agree on the sentiment. Uh, strongly disagree to strongly agree on respect. And again, they're not all exactly strongly disagree to agree, but they're all on a five point scale uh, similar to this. Predict what the likely ordinal outcome is for each of our individual components. And then we take those components, pass them through our item response theory uh, estimation. So basically the probability of uh, this rater having scored uh, in a particular way or having um, get, uh, answered in a particular way to produce our continuous hate score that we just talked about a few minutes ago. All right, so again, the main difference is we go from raw text, featureize, train a model, make a prediction on a zero one outcome now what we're doing is those first couple steps are the same. We still take our raw text, we still featureize, uh, we still train a model, but in that model we add in uh, effect, a fixed effect to correct for the individual labeler's bias. So if I'm very severe, uh, we're going to want to correct for that, basically make uh, push my scores down a little bit, and then predict each of our components and predict the ordinal outcome uh, for each of our components and then transform each of those predictions into a continuous hate speech score, which then gives us the ability to say, uh, here, here's how we scored on respect. Here's how we scored on humiliate. Uh, and here's how we scored in our final continuous outcome uh, as well. Right, so this is a much richer understanding where we not only have hate speech scores that can be compared to one another, but also we have these individual components and we could say something about uh, the content of the text or the likely content of the text uh, based on these uh, operationalizations of these 
uh, components of hate speech. OK, and you can see what the benefit is by looking at the uh, how these things correlate with one another. So you'll note that none of these uh, are below zero, so they all kind of positively uh, correlate with one another. But you could see how our various components uh, work together. I think the biggest one should be violence and genocide should highly correlate with one another. If someone's strong, if the comments predicted to be uh, strongly agree for genocide, it's also probably uh, very highly correlated with violence as a strongly agree. Uh, for example, so that gives us a good way to say what are these various dimensions? How do they kind of vary with one another? Um, and can we say something about how they kind of combine together? All right, and that gets us to what exactly this debiasing is doing. I'll only say a little bit more just so that we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, but that's this bit right here. So where I said where we said estimate the labeler bias. That's essentially what's happening right here. In our final hidden layer, we take our labeler bias, add it as a fixed effect, uh, essentially onto uh, our neural network here, and then go ahead and predict our ordinal outcomes for each of our uh, components. So this would be for one particular component. And you can see what happens that we can go from predicted probabilities with no bias adjustment, and this is just one example, I think, to our predicted probabilities with bias adjustment. So this would be somebody who's more likely to label something uh, as hate speech than the crowd would as a whole. Uh, and this kind of shoves us back towards what the uh, distribution would be like uh, with a bias correction. Yeah, I think I'll wrap up to talk about our future work. And again, uh, we could talk more in depth, but just to make sure that there's plenty of time for questions. Uh, in terms of our future work, uh, one of the next places that we're going to go is thinking about the fairness and machine learning implications of uh, this work. So starting to think through, are there certain groups that are more affected by our models and similar models that are detecting hate speech at scale? Uh, are there certain groups that are affected more? Is there counter speech that's uh, erroneously flagged as a false positive at higher rates than uh, we would like? Do we uh, fail to detect certain types of sentiments? So Sarcasm is the one that I mention a lot. Uh, do we uh, tag that as hate speech more often than not, so give that a false positive uh, more often than we would like? Uh, so that's one direction that we're kind of going with this. Otherwise, we're hoping that we open up some opportunities for causal inference, so experimenting with counter speech interventions on assessing how well counter speech works to combat hate speech. So counter speech would be, you see hate speech on a platform, the next commenter says something, to correct the information, to can't, to show support for that group, to basically try and combat that speech online, basically combating speech with more speech. How, how well do these kind of counter speech interventions work? We hope this opens up the opportunity to run those kinds of experiments. And then otherwise, we're, all, we're still looking at improved labeling, adding more platforms, expanding beyond the English language. There's a lot of stuff, even just in the US, uh, that uh, involves other languages, but then we can also port this over to other uh, international con uh, contexts as well. And then thinking through different constructs, different media other than text, uh, and uh, thinking through how this method also applies in other contexts as well. Right. So again, the main thing that I want to emphasize is that this works for hate speech, but this idea of taking a complex social phenomenon, theorizing it in a particular way, operationalizing it through particular categories, using IRT to do a transformation to deal with the fact that people are going to uh, see the same thing and think different things. There's just no way that's not going to happen, but using IRT to correct for that and then using deep learning to take those uh, de-biased uh, estimates and then do them at scale, do predictions on thousands or millions potentially of unlabeled comments. Okay, I will stop there so that we have uh, 15 or 20 minutes for questions.